All right. Um, on behalf of the School District of Holman School Board and the League of Women Voters, we welcome you. We appreciate your attendance at or viewing of this forum. Critical issues are faced by all elected officials, especially school board members. For those in the audience, we encourage your participation by submitting questions. Please use the note cards provided and you may forward your questions to Dr. Carlson or myself. Um, we also thank the League of Women Voters who have graciously committed their time each year to allow for the forum to discuss the relevant issues. We welcome and thank Ellen Franz, who serves as the moderator this evening, and Nancy Hill, who will serve as the timekeeper. Uh, I will introduce the school board candidates in the order that they will appear on the ballot. Candidate number one is Tom Cruise. Candidate number two is Joe Gittins. Candidate number three is Cheryl Hancock and candidate number four is Gary Dunlap. The school board election is scheduled for Tuesday, April 1st. Please make sure that you get out to vote. Mark April 1st on your calendar. Nothing is more important than education and voting. <clears throat> Once again, I thank the League of Women Voters for their sponsorship of this, uh, of this forum. I will turn the program over to moderator Ellen Franz. Thank you. The format this evening um, is as follows. There will be a two-minute opening by each of the candidates. And following that, uh, I have quite a few questions already prepared to uh, ask from the audience. Uh, and each candidate will have one minute to respond to each question. And so we'll just go down the uh, list, so to speak. There is not a rebuttal time. You just get one shot at the question. And then as we get close to uh, an hour in length, there'll be a closing statement from each of the candidates, also two minutes. And Nancy has the uh, stopwatch on the card, so you might keep your eye on her um, because she'll st be sticking up the cards and a stop sign um, should you begin to run over the time allotted, okay? So we'll start um, this evening with uh, Tom Cruise. Uh, your opening, Tom? Yes, good evening everyone. My name is Tom Cruz. I am uh, running for school board and uh, thank you Gary, uh, Cheryl and Joe for running as well. It's nice to have some people here. Um, I've um, moved here in 1998 because of the school system. Um, I have varying backgrounds and different, different, uh, different things. I've done pr professionally. I am a, I've got a teaching degree. Um, I've taught professionally as a corporate instructor. I have, I'm self-employed. Um, there's, I have a lot of different perspectives on different things. I have, I hope I can do this. I didn't ask anybody, but this is my, show it to your TV there. It's my Tom Cruise for um, Home and School Board. It's my Facebook. It's a public Facebook. It's, uh, anyone can see it. You can Google it. Um, my views are, uh, are pro localism, um, as, as it's stated in the the, um, the newspaper. Um, my kids inter uh, did internet school, and they did very well. And I, I thank you again for inviting me today, and I'm looking forward to having a lively discussion. Mr. Gittins. Good evening. My name is Joe Gittins, and I've been on the school board for, for this past three years, and. Uh, well, on, that, on that time period, I was a member of the Finance Committee, the Collective Bargaining, the Buildings and Grounds, and uh, a lot of board meetings. Uh, my background is pretty similar to Tom's. Uh, I was in the Navy for a, a bit of time, and then I finished a bachelor's degree with uh, majors in math and music, and then I finished a master's in vocational education, which is a word that we do not use or hear too much of anymore and this is one of my platforms is to get vocational education back into the realm of things thank you thank you um cheryl hancock your opening thank you well i want to begin by thanking the league of women voters ellen and nancy for participating this night tonight and the other candidates for being here as well it's a great way to share our thoughts and our values with the voters in the district as they prepare to vote on April 1st. This is my seventh run for the school board and I'm proud to have served the past 18 years. We've accomplished many things and seen many changes, but one thing remains the same. The focus should be and the importance of student learning. 
As we're faced with continued changes on the state and local level, it's important to have a Board of Education with the experience, background, and commitment to public education that is now in place. I look forward to answering your questions this evening and for your vote on April 1st. Thank, thank you. Mr. Dunlap? I'd like to welcome the other candidates to the, to the meeting tonight as well. Uh, my name is Gary Dunlap. I've lived in the Homeless School District for about 40 years. Uh, I'm, I'm a professional engineer by trade. <clears throat> I graduated from University of Wisconsin La Crosse as an English major. Uh, I raised my family in the school district and now I'm raising seven, soon to be eight grandchildren. They all go to the school district of Holman. I'm extremely proud of our district, the teachers, the support staff, the administration, the students of our district. We've all had our moments like any family, but we've always been able to sit down, discuss, formulate a plan, and execute. We've gone through tremendous growth and challenge upon challenge, and we always managed to come out better when, than when we went in. And that is testimony to the work ethics, dedication of the children, and the community pride that goes into this district day to day. People come and go, yet Homeland has kept its identity and continues to be a place where people want to raise their children. Again, I'm so proud of being lucky enough to be a small piece of the puzzle and to be a part of the board that's as diverse and, and dedicated as our current board is. I never, I never, I've always wanted the young people in this community to just to be safe and to be happy. And I'll continue to be an advocate for the student first and foremost. I will work hard to make sure that we get the very best of education for our students with the money allocated to us by the community. I do understand that education is much more than learning from books. But learning how to live your life in harmony, be productive, be honest, and be giving to those that are not as fortunate as yourself. We owe it to our children to provide them with tools to succeed or the tools to find their way to being successful. Thank you. Uh, the first question will go to Joe Gettins. And the question is, do you support the implementation of the Common Core State Standards? Why or why not? I hesitate to say why or why not because uh, being a former math teacher, I see, I see the importance of math, <coughs> I see the importance of STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So there's got to be all phases, not just one particular core. Reading, writing, and arithmetic is fine, but we also have to teach respect and responsibility. Ms. Hancock? Well, I think Holman has um, begun to implement common core standards in our school district. We've invested a lot of time, energy, and dollars in um, establishing that. When it came to the district, I think two or three years ago, um, we had lively discussion and discussion about the common core and what that meant. It is a federal initiative um, yet Holman has always taken the position that what we believe is important locally should be part of our school district. So while we are implementing, and I support the implementation, the continued implementation, um, otherwise it would be a step backward, we also do that with the understanding that if we have local initiatives, local values that we want included, that they will be included. Mr. Dunlap, same question. I'm not too surprised to see this as one of the questions. Um, to, I, I recently read a quote in the paper that says, by now we're, we're well familiar with the mandates of the Common Core and what the architects would like to see in our classrooms. More collaboration, more critical thinking, more real-world -real practice, less memorization, <coughs> and less direct instruction. But uh, I think that quote came from Bill Gates, and I wonder where he got his educational background to make comments and, and to make plans to educate our own students. How could that be a bad thing? It seems like all seem to be admirable goals like me that, that I can see, but it's like <coughs> the schools are so diverse from United, in the United States, it's like trying to set a, a set of metrics to, to, uh, to, to instruct someone how to fly an aircraft, and, and then those instructions are supposed to cover from Ben Franklin's kite to the shuttlecraft. Uh, it's just so diverse across the United States that uh, uh, that you have to make them. Maybe we should split the country up into sections or or schools on class one, two, and three, or something like that, and make it a little more easier to, to manage. But it's it's uh, it'd be an awful big elephant in the room if we tried to stop or start now. I think. 
Please repeat the question. Do you support the implementation of the Common Core State Standards? Why or why not? If they're better than No Child Left Behind, I definitely support them. <laughs> um, no Child Left Behind was a, just uh, was a reactive um, way of addressing issues, taking the teaching out of the classroom and putting it to teach to the test, which proved to be highly ineffective in many areas, especially down in Georgia where I, when I was an airline mechanic for Delta Airlines, the county next to us did not do well and it actually, um, the county lost its accreditation, but that doesn't, that's why I don't live there anymore. Um, but as far as Common Core, there are, um, I do like what Gary had mentioned about the um, sort of a flip school sort of perspective where um, I think it has more um, ideas of instead of um, teaching and um, staging like, like a teacher would be on a stage with a sage kind of thing trying to perform to learn to having students learn stay on the side and collaborate and work with the students um, i know this other bill sb 619 specifically states that it does not want the uh, I'm, I'm out of time okay anyway 619 specifically states that the curriculum should not leave the school board they do not dictate the school board curriculum. It's really important localism, which Cheryl had mentioned, the beliefs, this area, the Common Core is a big entity, and that equals problems. It always does. The next question goes for first to Cheryl Hancock, and uh, I received two similar questions, so I'm gonna read them both, but I think they're getting to the same thing. Um, uh, the first is, what has been your positive involvement, influence with the school district of Holman over the past several years? Um, how are you involved with the Holman Public Schools? Do you regularly attend meetings? Do you serve on any district committees? So people who are on the board can answer one way, and perhaps those people that um, are seeking to be on the board would have a slightly different answer. Sure, sir. Certainly. Currently, I'm serving as president of the school board. I've served in that role, um, served as vice president and clerk in the past. And I think I have served on every committee except finance committee um, of the board. Um, currently, I'm helping to lead the personnel and governance committee. Um, besides that, um, and I think I do participate and attend very regularly all the meetings. Um, I also look for outside professional development and participate in WASB, the Wisconsin Association of School Board um, activities so that I can learn from what other districts are doing throughout the state. But I also am involved in the community and have served on the Holman Area Foundation and am currently involved with the collaborative um, community collaborative center trying to bring a, a multi-generational center to the school to the school district to the area so have a variety It'd take too long for me to talk about the 18 years that I've been on the board the things I've done but um, certainly have been very active mr. Dunlap well I too have uh, served on the school board this is uh, my second time around I, I served for five or six years mm -hmm. I guess and left for a couple years and came back um, served mainly as a treasurer, but I have been the vice president of the school board. Um, serves on a lot of, several committees, uh, very active in the, in the technology committee. Uh, attend very many uh, student activities as I can. Of course, with uh, seven grandchildren, that's not too hard to do. Um, and I enjoy them all. Um, I, I wish there was more time to, to be able to be more involved in more things. Mr. Cruz? I hate to make you do this, but your, That's okay. your question was kind of convoluted. You kind of didn't get to the point. So could you say it again, please? So the, the point would be, um, what has been your positive involvement, influence with the school district over the past several years? Um, are you involved with the home and public schools? Do you attend meetings? Do you serve on any district committees? No, on any committees, but I give them a lot of money sometimes. That helps a little. <laughs> I have. I've supported different things with the schools. My business has, so and because I believe in the schools, but I don't serve any on any committees. But 
As far as volunteerism goes, I've worked on Habitat for Humanity in the Critical Home Repair Committee, which I go evaluate houses and work with people who don't have, Habitat for Humanity is an organization that has people that are, are, are vested in the home. And I work with them and we solve problems and we get them in the house. And so that's, what, that's one thing I do. Um, I've been educate, I'm education chair for WAHI, which is a, a tax exempt organization for the state, Wisconsin Association of Home Inspectors. I was treasurer and got 2009 uh, volunteer of the award for the home and library. So trying to get a library, which is like pulling teeth in this town, so a real library, and um, hopefully we'll get that activity center in place someday that's next door to the high school. Thank you. Mr. Gittins? Could you read it again? Um, what has been your positive involvement or influence with the school district of Holman in the past several years? Are you involved with the Holman Public Schools? Do you regularly attend meetings, serve on any district committees? Those okay. are examples. I do uh, attend meetings regularly. I don't know if I've missed any at all during my three-year tenure. And I have been on the Finance Committee and the Student Achievement Committee. Uh, did some collective bargaining and buildings and grounds. Uh, I've also uh, formed a subchapter S corporation of my own, which I use to do research and analysis uh, and a little real estate work. Uh, and that's pretty much uh, what I've done for the for the Holman School District is I've tried to be kind of a silent when I when I can't talk, I'd rather listen. Thank you. Um, the next question goes first to Gary Dunlap, and it is this. Recently, the school district of Holman joined six other regional school districts by forwarding a concept of an extended <coughs> school year calendar to the Department of Public Instruction. Do you support exploring alternative calendars? Why or why not? Well, I, I'm, I always support anything that, uh, exploring anything that might have the potential of, of being a good thing for students and uh, and helping their education. Uh, I'm a traditionalist by heart, and I, I I just as soon have kids be kids in the summertime and and have the two or three months off in a block. Um, and also, I worry about the parents scheduling daycare and alternate care for their students if they have a week off here and a week off there rather than a solid block in the summertime. Um, but that all can be overweighed with with something that's really good for the students and support the students and, and make a better education for them. But uh, right now, um, uh, full-time school year-round year seems like an awful, big, an awful big jump for us. Changing the time the schools are, that are in session, that might be something we could sure look at and improve upon, I'm sure. Mr. Cruz? Yes, I, uh, I, uh, I think um, all year-round school which is kind of a misnomer of a term. I think uh, students should be allowed to do maybe some education online. The teachers are more than qualified to create some curriculum to keep them engaged over the summer. Three months off can be a little bit too long. Both my children did summer school and both got scholarships. My daughter's in Platteville, my son's in the Navy, in the New Park program. Um, I also believe the school's early start times um, are detrimental toward high school students. There's a study that came out today, or just recently, by the University of Minnesota that's, that had 9,000 students studied that said that later start times are better for the high schoolers, and it doesn't work to go to bed earlier. It just doesn't work. So I'm a big proponent, and I, I agree with Gary as well, because my daughter is self, she's not self-employed. She works uh, at a local place, and she makes money in the summertime, and it helps with with college, but, um, and there is a time they had maybe not to be so engaged. But the schools are, uh, one thing I'll say for my, my daughter is the custodial factor. She really, she really um, did well in Holman, and um, I think that is something the school's gonna have to come back and help with a different curriculum or a different school year is to be there to help the, student, help the parents a little bit. Thank you. Mr. Gittins. I, I ran into what they called 4515 back in my earlier teaching years over in the uh, Wausau area, uh, city of Schofield had what they called a 4515. They had 45 days of continuous education and 15 days off. And uh, I never heard where this gathered any kind of momentum. Uh, I, 
if there were other schools that followed it, uh, I, I don't know why. But uh, I think it's best to leave things as it is right now until they do more work on the whole program, not just some legal uh, concept that's coming out of le the legislature. Thank you. Ms. Hancock. Well, I certainly support exploring the idea, and I think as we've had conversations about it, um, I have not made my mind up one way or another as to whether this is a good idea. What I support is asking DPI whether or not they would consider granting this. If they say no, then um, we start over, we look at the, you know, go back to the drawing board. But I have long been called the stakeholder czar in the district, and it's very important for me before we make any kind of changes like this that we would involve all of our stakeholders, so our students, our families, our parents, our staff and employees, uh, business people in the community because of how they depend on students for work in the summer, and just community members who live here who don't have children, that that would be, if we did get a potential go-ahead to look at this, that would be the first step. And parallel to that, we'd want to see the research that says that this sort of calendar does provide for student learning, better provide for student learning, because that is our focus. So I support exploring it, but I haven't made a decision um, and want to wait for all of the data to come back before I would take a position on whether I support the actual calendar. Uh, the next question goes first to uh, Mr. Cruz, and this is the question. What are your top three budget items that you have a commitment to support? Are there any that you would not support? Hmm. Well, um, schools buy in communities and they keep property values up. So um, I moved here and I bought a house, I built a house, so I would support um, budget items. I would have to say, um, the schools in general. I don't really have any specific items I could think of offhand that I would not support. I, I'm pretty much open to anything as long as it brings value to the student. I, uh, I don't have, I don't like to, uh, in my business, I've, I'm judged every day on my objectivity and I have legal exposure and my staff does as well. So I don't make assumptive statements. There's nothing in this homeless school district that has made me think I wouldn't support it because I, I would say, if anything, I would have, a, have something that would engage the teachers more because they are our biggest resource and they are the ones that'll think outside the box because we are losing, we are losing students. You are losing students that are, that are enrolling out. That's what Jay had said in your one meeting not too long ago and there's some other issues dollars and cents wise that we need to keep the school strong. Thank you. Mr. Gittins. <clears throat> Budgetary things we should always look at is, is, what is what, what's it doing for the students? The primary purpose of education is students. And so whatever our budget needs are or, or whatever we need to cut, we should think first of how it's going to affect the students in, in, in the district. I think that's the most important things. Ms. Hancock. Well, um, the top three budgetary priorities, I think, is what you're looking for. And certainly um, technology, I think we've been hearing the past few months about how we have gone wireless and initiated some new technology um, opportunities, but we need to have the tools in the hands of our educators so that they can deliver those things to our students. I think curriculum dollars for students who don't learn in the traditional manner, um, we are becoming more individualized in how we provide education and I think we're seeing a growth in that area and as we um, look at new curriculum um, decisions and implementations I think we need to look at some of those individualized learning opportunities and then I also think we need to focus because research does say that what impacts a student the most is a qualified um, quality teacher in the classroom and we have to look at staff wide making sure we have adequate dollars to retain and recruit um, quality staff and we have to make sure that we're keeping up with those kind of things. Um, there certainly are a variety of other things that come forth each and every year. My time is up. 
<laughs> Mr. Dunlap. Well, 2014 has been a great year for the Homeless School District budget. Uh, we've included some catch-up money for a few unmet needs, uh, and that's important. We've not had to talk about asking for more money for the voters to support our school district, and that's a good thing as well. Um, I agree with Cheryl that uh, we need to generate additional capital in the next few years to address technology. We've got a good start on it. Um, <laughs> I'm an advocate of, 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 of the new tablet technology for middle school and high school students. I'd like to see that happen. Um, there are educational tools out there that are very effective now. We need to stay on top of those. Um, and to quote Cheryl again, um, that uh, we should canvas the stakeholders and make sure the stakeholders are involved on, on what our next top priority should be and what we should be spending our money on. Thank you. The next question goes first to Mr. Gittins. And um, it uh, goes back to something that uh, Ms. Hancock just mentioned. Um, the school district of Holman is examining teacher compensation models. Do you support looking at alternative models that may Possibly, possibly lead to changing the current model of compensation? And I'm gonna, again, read a second question that's similar. How should teachers be evaluated and compensated? Well, I think all these things are being, being addressed right now by, by Dr. Carlisle and, and, and his staff. And I think uh, as far as what the teachers are getting paid, I think we know that you, you, you pay for what you get. And if you're not going to give them a, a good salary and good compensation, you might just as well forget about getting, having quality educators. Ms. Hancock? Well, as part of the compensation model um, committee, I think what we're looking at and what we see is that the traditional uh, model that we have in place recognizes ongoing credits, summer credits that teachers receive, they work for, and then years of experience. Those are the two main things that are recognized in the current model we have. Newer teachers may not need to get additional credits to continue with their licensure. There, there's a new program with the PDP and um, the state licensure which doesn't require that to happen and so they may write a PDP, uh, a professional development plan that doesn't include those additional credits and then they would not receive any compensation for that because it doesn't follow the traditional manner. So certainly in what we've seen there is a need to study this um, and look forward to receiving more feedback on it. Um, I'd really need a lot more time to talk about how our educators should be evaluated and compensated. Um, but I do support us looking at a, a different compensation model. Mr. Dunlap? Uh, at the risk of being repetitive, uh, any time you can look at something and, ma and make it better, uh, you, you should do that. If there's a better model of compensation out there, then we should be taking a look at it. Nothing stays the same over time, and you can always make improvements. Um, teachers' education has changed, uh, student needs change, the community feel how the community feels, um, the stakeholders in the community, that all changes. So in, in order for us to be current, we should be changing. Um, the tough part is how do you measure a teacher? What metrics do you use? If someone asks you what an education was, write 500 words to explain it, uh, you'd probably get 500 different answers from 500 different people. So uh, putting a metric on how to measure a student and how to measure a teacher's effectiveness or an administrator's effectiveness has always been an issue and, and always a challenge to uh, figure out which is, which is the best thing to do. Mr. Cruz. Well, um, I always view everything in dollars and cents. And I would say with the economy, and I know um, Jay had commented with his report on the increased health costs with uh, the Affordable Care Act. I suppose that's coming down the pike. Of course, we don't know anything really what's it's always getting delayed, so who knows. But with those increases um, and with possibly with losing some of the, our dollars. And my kids took money away from home and schools because they went to Waukesha for internet school. Um, I would want to address that. But as far as the teacher's compensation, money-wise, um, I would say more of a, um, instead of a benefits package, more of a contribution type of package. I, I think that's the way a defined contributions as opposed to a defined benefits package. So what, this is what the school's gonna give the teachers as opposed to a set benefits, because that's when you kind of run into maybe cost overruns. And it kind of empowers the person a little bit more. 
I would say a lot of times in this situation, sometimes teachers were, um, they get in situations and with the uh, insurance and maybe kind of like golden handcuffs, so to speak. But if they made their own decisions on their on what the and the, the schools or said what they're going to give the teachers, they would it would be much more um, applicable. It's really tough to answer these questions in one minute. <laughs> it is really tough. Uh, the the next question goes first to um, Cheryl Hancock. Do you support a one-to-one -one technology drive implementation for staff and students? If so, how would you um, pay for it? Well, I do support it. I think paying for it is the difficult um, question. I think that we've talked about in our district allowing students to bring their own devices. Oftentimes they have devices at home that could be used and integrated with the school system. Um, that would delay the need to purchase one-to-one -one devices for every student. Um, but I think we also need to look at some other creative ways of bringing those devices, acquiring those devices from um, the outside world. Again, I think that we have to take a stand as a district, and it may require some dollars that are targeted toward that, but eventually I suspect we will provide, as, as some area school districts do, provide one-to-one -one, um, technology tools, whether it's a, an iPad or whatever, a tablet, it, who knows what it's gonna be. It may be one thing this year and something different five years down the road. Mr. Dunlap? I, I support the one-on-one -on -one technology as well. We've shown support for technology in the school district uh, over and over again, and uh, becoming wireless for the district is a, is a big step toward going one-on-one, uh, -on -one and uh, <laughs> it'll be a challenge for us, but I feel, I feel like we can get there. Uh, there's lots of alternatives out there. I've talked to some school districts who have, have joined partnerships with Apple and Dell and, and some other companies to help support those things. And uh, just recently, our technology group showed us some some one-on-one -on -one technology that were very small tablets, but uh, uh, the tablets all talked to each other, and the, the students could talk to the, the teachers. And the technology is moving so fast that, uh, that uh, I think we need to get it done, and I think we will get it done in the next couple of years. Mr. Cruz? You say it again, please, the question. Do you support a one-to-one -one technology device implementation for staff and students? If so, how would you pay for it? Well, um, I guess if you're going to do it for one, you should probably offer it for all. You can't say you can, some can have it, some can't have it. I would, I would support that. If it helps empower the students, there, there would be um, obviously benefits. The best thing I can think about is like Singapore that invested much more in education. The, the G, GDP of the country in, in 1960 is around $2,000. Now the average person makes around $40,000 in Singapore. Singapore has completely turned its economy around. Where the United States is kind of on a, it's doing that, but it's not a, near as effective as it could be. So um, if we invest in students, we certainly invest in our future. Um, would I raise taxes to do it, or maybe a referendum? Possibly, but I can definitely see, uh, Gary, Gary had mentioned some outside sources, um, and possibly a little more private, privatization and bringing in some companies to try to um, work with the students a little bit. That, that should always be on the table. Mr. Gittins? I'm kind of in a quandary here as far as what really truly is one-to-one -one teaching. Uh, I've worked with handicapped children f for several years in an Autogamy County handicap program and this was one-to-one -one education, whereas where you taught a little guy to, to operate a dishwasher one day, and you come back the next day and taught him the same thing, and the next day the same thing, and the next thing the day the same thing. So that was one-to-one -one education. And if we're gonna have one-to-one -one education, we, we had better uh, truly understand that the needs of our school system to pay for having this kind of uh, education where, where there's a lot of new gadgets coming out there that'll be obsolete today or obsolete tomorrow. So we have to look at it very carefully. The next question goes uh, first to Gary Dunlap. And the question is, what is the role for virtual learning within the public school system? How should virtual 
um, funding be paid for? Well, that's uh, close to the, the previous question, and then that with technology and the one-on-one -on -one education um, needs to be get done first. Uh, virtual virtual education, uh, I think that the, there's a place for virtual education, and we should support it uh, as a resource, as a resource only, and that means to supplement supplement uh, regular education and to give students. Uh, access to additional additional education and additional educational opportunities. I don't I don't see virtual education as being the base and the common the common base and the overall uh, component of a, a good student's education, but I see it as part of a, a education and and in today's world it's it's inevitable that they're going to have to uh, be part of the virtual education uh, society in the future. Mr. Cruz? Yes, I support virtual education, and not because just my children did it, but uh, I asked a counselor at the uh, E-Achieve um, prom in the Kalahari a few years ago, what was the number one reason she liked this school? And she answered like that, the empowerment factor and the self-determination factor. So that serves the students the way we want to serve them. Um, if we want to become world leaders, as the Homeland School District says, we need to empower the students and make them feel that they are in charge of their education, which I think we do anyway, but uh, this is one venue of doing that. Now, as far as paying for it, was that one of your part of your question? Um, I, I also commented that my dollars, school dollars, went to Waukesha that could have come to Holman. And we had a meeting years ago with, we had talked a little bit to Dale about this with my wife. Um, I would support using the student teachers to enhance it, the online education and then bring some of those tax dollars back to Holman and, uh, and have, have students make H Holman the Waukesha of Wisconsin. There's nothing, no reason we couldn't do that. That's how, that's how I view education and to keep our schools strong. Thank you. Mr. Gittins. I look at virtual learning uh, and I look at my, my, my fourth item was, does everyone learn the same? And that's my answer. Does everyone learn the same for virtual learning? Virtual learning, is there a machine or a mechanism out there that everyone can understand? So virtual learning, I think, is just another title. It used to be vocational, tech, vocational education, then it was technical education, now it is industrial technical education. So there's gonna be a new title for everything. But are they all going to learn? That's the important thing. Ms. Hancock. Well, I think um, I agree that we need to look at individual learning um, needs of students. And there may be needs that we aren't meeting right now. And we do lose students to area school districts. <coughs> We certainly should look at it as a possible tool to complement what we're doing now in Holman. Um, I don't necessarily, I didn't make that choice for my children to have them um, attend school through a virtual learning environment. Um, I think for some students that's a, a good way, a positive way of going. But I think there's still something lost in not having that opportunity to interact with students and teachers um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And we hear about that, that students thrive when they have an adult that they can interact with um, person to person on a daily basis. And that, that helps them um, in their uh, interests their their future to to thrive and so I I again think that it could certainly complement what we're doing right now in Holman um, but um, paying for it again would be just like we pay for any other new curriculum initiative that we um, implement the next question goes first to mr. Cruz how does a board member's leadership role differ from an administrator's leadership role? Well, the board makes directions, the administrator carries them out. So we, uh, we decide on course, we decide on curriculum, we decide on the path of the school, we decide if we want to keep them. Um, but it's his job or her job to enforce what the board decides. 
we should not get involved in the um, in the mechanics of the enforcement. We are big picture people. We are looking, for me, if I'm elected board member of Holman, I'm looking ten, five, 10, 20 years down the road to keep the school strong. So um, I, we are visionary people. We look at the big picture and we get the data from various sources, committees and such, and we make decisions based on the experts, the, the teachers, student feedback, maybe some surveys from people, exiting students, that I, I don't know how often that's done, but, um, and we make long-term decisions. Thank you. Mr. Gittins. I think about uh, the leadership role is not so much a matter of visibility, being seen doing something. I think you gotta be the, more or less the unsung hero behind the lines and make sure that everything just keeps working and not getting a pat on the back for, for any, each and everything that you do. So being a leader is just mainly making th sure that things get done. Ms. Hancock. Well, certainly I would agree with what Mr. Cruz said. Um, the board is the vis our visionaries. Um, we set the tone, we set the philosophy of the district. However, I would hope that that would be a role that our administration plays as well. I think it differs in that we um, set those policies. We don't get involved in the day-to-day -day mechanics, but we certainly are there as a voice um, for the community to bring those ideas and those um, values to the administration to help them understand what's important to the community. Um, the role of the administrator is also to motivate those district employees, those stakeholders in the district to accomplish what it is that the board um, has set out as our policy. Mr. Dunlap. <coughs> I think the board members, um, responsibility to set policy, uh, to set goals, uh, and above all, be advocates for the students, do the right thing for the students. The superintendent is really the only person that works for the school board. Uh, no one else does, everyone else works for the superintendent. Um, the only time the school board has influence over anything that's going on in the school district is when we're in session. Um, we also should be the eyes and ears of the stakeholders uh, for the district. Um, we should listen to what the stakeholders have to say and bring it forward as a board school board member. That includes the teachers, the students, parents, uh, businesses, etc. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question goes first to Mr. Gittins, and I've had several questions that are about uh, voucher schools, and one of the, uh, actually two of the writers asked, um, are you in favor of tax dollars being used for vouchers for, pu for private school? Why or why not? Well, of course, I, I graduated from Aquinas High School in La Crosse, Wisconsin, so uh, my parents paid for our education while other kids who lived right across the street or next door went to the public schools. So what is happening, of course, is, is in the meantime, schools like Globe and whatever have, have came along and are grabbing up the money that is out there, uh, and, or else seeing that the students get a loan to pay for that education and then finding out that they cannot find a job in doing this particular form. So voucher, voucher education is kind of a pro and con thing. There are good points and there are bad points. Ms. Hancock? Well, I don't support expanding um, the voucher system as it currently is. In fact, I don't support where it is right now. We saw um, an expansion of it most recently, and statistics showed that those students who, as it was presented to us, didn't have opportunities, those students, you know, how could we be so... Um, mean to the people who um, were low income and they weren't getting those opportunities to provide a good school, yet the, the research showed that 75%, if not more, of those students who received vouchers already were attending private schools. 
And so the vast majority of those folks were parents, families that made, had made that decision already to send their students to private schools. And it does hurt school districts like Holman. It does have an impact. I think it changes what the Constitution in Wisconsin says. It's public education. We are, the state of Wisconsin is supposed to equally support public education. But I think it's changing it to public support of education. And um, we need to support public education. Thank you. Mr. Dunlap. I don't uh, support the school voucher program uh, either. It, it seems to make sense that uh, a, a parent should be able to take their, their tax money to any school they want to take it to. Um, and it seems that we talk about loss of residence of the homeless school district when they do that, but we don't have that student to educate and take care of. So up front it makes sense, but it's not a level playing field. We, we're not allowed to uh, make sure that the, the nutrition guidelines are met. Um, the student with special needs, make sure their needs are met. Uh, and every teacher and administrator should be certified in those schools that they're gonna take our tax money. Uh, their books should be open. Uh, we should be able to look at their finances and what they're doing with their finances. I, I hate to get, I hate to use the term, but we, I hate to move toward uh, educating for profit uh, and that kind of that kind of has rings that way when I, when I when I hear the term of school vouchers mr. Cruz I, I do support voucher schools um, mainly just because it's tax dollars and we're all paying tax dollars um, I don't know Cheryl has a lot of good information that I'm not uh, up on so I can't really comment on everything she said I would say it it smacks in the face of cronyism, which is really common when something gets bigger and bigger. You can have situations where people take advantage, where they're really Christian, from a Christian's perspective, you should not, which unfortunately is not always common these days. But from a system on a whole, I, I don't, I support voucher schools. I think that, the, um, I think it's reality. I think the schools, the public schools, Holman is going to continually see this coming and I think it's just a reality today's student is tomorrow's customer like it or not we are changing this country is changing technology is constantly changing and that's why I run for this position because I have the skills and I have the background professionally I've done many things in many different industries to keep these schools strong so um, I'm just a real realist I think um, we have we can't avoid it. It's going to be there. It's going to get stronger. Khan Academy is a free school. It's huge. If you go to, the, go to the website, look at it two years ago. Look at it now. It's night and day what it was. That's free, supposedly. Thank you. Um, this is a related question. It goes first to uh, Cheryl Hancock. Should uh, voucher uh, schools have the same state mandates and standards imposed upon them as the public schools? Yes. I certainly think things like um, teacher accreditation, teacher um, oh, licensure, even administrative licensure, certainly those standards should be there. We're hearing stories about schools in Madison that, or in, excuse me, in Milwaukee that they were in existence. They lost their voucher licensure because they lost their accreditation and now they want to come back again. And there are some initiatives by some of our local um, representatives to introduce some of those um, standards that should be set by all schools. If a student graduates from a, a public education um, school district in Wisconsin, again, the common core, there are common standards that they will, they will graduate and they will have. And the same should be for any school district, any school system that receives property tax dollars. I really believe that if they're going to receive tax dollars, they should be held to the same standards. Um, Mr. Dunlop, you kind of answered this the first time around, but. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just make one more comment and that is that the parents are making choices with some of these voucher schools to send their children there uh, and there's and there's some some assumptions that that the school is going to be better for their their, their students etc uh, we owe it to those parents to make sure there's a, a minimum level of credibility with those schools before we allow our tax dollars to go that way mr. Cruz would you repeat the question please I'm sorry should voucher schools have the same state mandates and standards imposed upon them as public schools? 
if they're getting tax dollars, they should. Um, if they're not, then then I suppose they have more more leeway. Um, but I do think that they should be held to the same standards. Um, the I think it's interesting how this has come about. I, I, I Holman's always been a good steward of money, I believe, and teaching their students. But I can't imagine. I'm sure there are public schools that have done horribly with money and horribly with education and given maybe just the student body itself. So it's tough to say that teachers aren't doing their job or whatever. There's too many variables there that way more than one minute can possibly give me. But um, adapt adaptive gains testing is a, is a method of testing students how well they're doing. I think that should be integral because I think teaching to the test <coughs> shortcuts the teacher and makes them look like they're not doing their job. And that's just not fair. Thank you. Mr. Gittins. Yes, they should. <laughs> okay, I'm going to uh, ask one more question. It's it's kind of a long one, um, but I think we have time for this before we do the closing statements. And the question goes first to Mr. Dunlap. Oh, sure. Happy to. <laughs> um, what is your stance on providing the curriculum, the resources, training, and supplies to the entire district to support the teachers? to accomplish the goals of the district, common core, and implemented models for teaching. Could you repeat that? Yeah, just I minute. will say it <laughs> once again. <laughs> there are different parts, I guess. What is your stance on providing the curriculum, resources, training, supplies, to the entire district to support the teachers to accomplish the goals of the district, common core, and implemented models for teaching? Well, I, th I think it's the job of the school, school district and the school board specifically to provide uh, curriculum and support to the teachers to meet exactly what we're asking them to do. Uh, we shouldn't be asking them to do anything that, that we, we're not supporting fully. Um, nothing's worse than having uh, uh, unfunded mandates put up on you as a teacher uh, so we, if, we, if we implement something as a school district or uh, as a community, then we should support this, the teachers fully. Um, you use the term in their uh, common core, and, and I've stated my view on the common core before. It's, it's, it's too broad of a, a topic right now. If they want to split it up into north and south or east and west or split the uh, size of schools or educational, some way of, of leveling the playing field there, common core might have a chance. But uh, if Common Core ever did become part of the school district and we ever had to have meet Common Core requirements, then absolutely we should support it 110 percent and give them all the resources they need to be successful. We don't ever want to set anybody up for failure. Mr. Cruz. Uh, I have to diddle with, with um, a little bit what Gary is saying. Um, it's kind of a big piece. but. As far as supporting the schools and supporting the teachers, um, well, I think we do that already. But if you think about support, uh, one thing you have to keep doing is you, uh, what I saw with eAchieve or IQ Academy was the connection we had with the teachers, with the parents. I constantly knew what my daughter was doing and so did my wife. It's if you, to support the teachers, the parents have to be engaged. It's, a, it's on my uh, public Facebook page, I talk about that. So I would, I would definitely create systems, ongoing systems that are easily maintained, don't take a lot of redoing, rewriting the whole thing, to empower the teachers to make the parents responsible and and that keep that line of communication going 110%. That's really huge. The custodial factor of the schools, too, is huge. And that constant communication with the teachers, so we're all on the same page, is paramount. Mr. Gittins? Could you say, read the question again? What is your stance on providing the curriculum, the resources, training, and supplies to the entire district? Now stop right there. Isn't that what we're doing right now? That's my question. Aren't we providing all these things f for the district? <coughs> no. That's 
Ms. Hancock. Well, certainly I agree that as we look at introducing new curriculum, and I know that we have in Holman most recently um, in two different areas, as we look at implementing those new um, curriculum resources, it's important that before we do that, we make sure that we're in a position to provide those tools, the supplies, the resources necessary to provide the training and support of our educators who are in the classroom who are going to be one-on-one -on -one delivering um, that curriculum to our students. And um, as things change, some of us change faster than others, and I think we need to recognize that and acknowledge that. As a district, I look at our faculty and I see a real variety from long time um, educators to right out of college educators and I think we have to sit back and understand that variety and the importance of making sure that when we deliver those uh, make those changes we provide those resources so that all of our staff can be successful because when our educators are successful our students are successful okay that concludes the uh, questions and the answers I want to thank uh, the folks that provided the questions, I hope I didn't mangle them too badly, and I apologize for not getting through all of the ones that were submitted this evening. So we're, we are ready to begin the closing statements, and we're back to uh, Mr. Cruz to, to give his closing. Two minutes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for everybody coming. Um, it's been really fun. I really enjoyed this kind of stuff. I could do another hour. I really could. I wish these questions could be a little bit longer. Um, I've been following the Holman School District for years, and I, I get very excited when I think about all the changes that are going on. And quite literally, if I don't win, I, I just see so many things going on that are so cool that I, I really don't have any concerns. But I also uh, like keeping busy, and, I'm, and I have a lot to offer the school. Um, I've done several different things professionally. I've been, I got the, when I was Delta Airlines as an airline mechanic, I got the Above and Beyond Award. When I worked at Rockland Flooring, I reduced recordable injuries from 18.5 a month to 1.5 a month. When I worked at Fastenal, I rewrote the new employee training program, a two week program, re increased retention 15%. When I worked at Airgas as a branch manager, I met sales goals every quarter I was there. When I, my, my business is, in my business, I've, uh, my insurance carrier said he's never met a company as professional as mine, and I got my insurance rates reduced from 10000 a year to less than 2000 It's because I, and, and when I worked as, when I was president of Wahi, I have, um, I, I kept the organization together and done a lot with the organization to make it a stronger organization. Now, I did all these things not because I have a God-given gift of leadership and, and authority. I had, at Delta, my, my, my friends nominated me. When I was at Fastenal, I worked with four other people. When I worked at Airgas, my sales managers and my support staff worked. And in my own business, realtors and my, my employees teach me so much. Ultimately, why I want to be your board member is because I work well with people, and I, I want to work with people I can learn something from. We're here to learn. We're, we're lifelong learners. I would learn a lot from this organization, and I would make this organization a lot stronger. I promise you that. Please vote for me April 1st. Thanks. Mr. Gittins? I, I think I can summarize uh, my purpose on the board is is that I am I am strictly a listener and I usually take in everything that is being said and and filter it through my my vast knowledge and understanding and experience uh, for that purpose to know what's going on and and to put it out as it as it comes so thank you Hancock well, thank you again to Ellen and Nancy for your support here this evening, to those in attendance and those watching at home for your interest in the upcoming school board election. When I first ran for office in 1996, and that dates me a little bit, my son was in elementary school and my daughter was a high school junior. I now have a granddaughter who's in kindergarten and I've seen firsthand how things have changed. 
I often say that my blood doesn't run red, it runs maroon. I grew up in a small community where their school colors, Cashton, were maroon and white, and went on to UW-La Crosse where I got my bachelor's in secondary education, um, social studies um, area, and again, the school colors there were maroon and gray this time. And then moved to Holman in 1990, and again, the school colors are maroon and white. So I'm very proud of my affiliation with the Holman School District. I have a long history of supporting public education and at a time of many changes and challenges it's important to have a school board that has the background and the experience necessary to see the district through these hard times. I think I've got that background and I would appreciate your vote on April 1st. Thank you. And Mr. Dunlap. I'd like to thank Ellen Nancy and the League of Women Voters for coming and helping us out tonight. Um, I would hope as a school board member that uh, they bring more to the board than take away. Um, I hear a lot, you know, they want to come someplace, come to the school board to learn and take things away from the school board. I would hope you bring things to the school board more than take things away. I'd like to put a plug in for the community center that wasn't mentioned tonight and I thought that uh, it might be. I'd like to put a plug in for the community center and say that uh, support it as much as you can. I think it's a good idea. Uh, we recognize there's more to education than learning basic education. There is developing good citizens, adults, and challenge themselves and the people around them and understand that we have to pay back to the community and work as a family to raise our kids. Responsibility contributing members to society. We open ourselves up to new ideas with the fact that technology is a large part of our young people's world. It's how they'll live, work, and function in the years to come. We need to give our teaching staff the tools to do the jobs the best they can. We owe it to our children to expose them to a lot of experiences in school. It's important for them to be able to sample the good things in life before making life choices. We owe it to our children to handle adversity, teach them how to handle adversity and challenges, how to approach and systematically attract problems and issues. <clears throat> We owe it to our students to keep pace with the education levels around us and those around the world. And we need to work toward knowing that those levels are and, and understand what, those, what we have to do to get to those levels. And above all, we have to keep our students safe and we have to, we have to make sure they're happy. And uh, that's what being a school board member is all about as far as I'm concerned. Though. Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, a sincere thank you to the League of Women Voters, Ellen Franz and Nancy Hill, and thank you to all the school board candidates for running and being interested in serving the school district of Holman. Please remember to vote on April 1st and have a great evening. <laughs>